Um, welcome to the Extending the Core to Your Court session. My name is Kathy Griffin. I'm on the Board of Directors here in, at NACOM, and I'm also Chair of the Core Committee. Um, so we're going to present to you the strategic um, planning curricula today. Um, doing that is Kent Pankey. Kent received his BA from Hampton Sydney College, his Juris degree from the College of William and Mary. Um, since 2005, he's been employed at the Supreme Court of Virginia. He's a fellow of the ICM Court Management Program. Um, he's also a co-author of the core curricula of strategic planning. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a court administrator in Michigan. So we're going to get started with, I'm just going to do a brief introduction of the core for those of you that aren't familiar with it, and then Kent will go into the strategic planning curricula. So for those of you that aren't familiar with the core, we're just going to do a, just a brief synopsis, synopsis of the um, website. Forgot, he told me to point it at the back. I'm not used to doing that. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we're going to, like I said, we're going to do a brief overview, how the core was revised, how it's structured now compared to the old core curricula, and just show you just some resources you can use from the core. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the old core competencies, and they were structured around what was called the wheel. Um, this was revised. Re back in 2009 with a grant from the State Justice Institute that began the programming of setting up the revision. So the old core curricula was the foundation for many um, educational programs. You've got the ICM, the Certified Court Manager, the Certified Court Executive, and then also MSU's Judi Judicial Administration Program use that lost a screen. So the new instead of the wheel is set up on um, the structure. We have three modules. We have the principal module, the practice module, and the vision module. So within each module are the various competencies. So this is our new logo for the core. And you'll see as they're intertwined within each one are the various competencies. Resources, that, for those of you that aren't familiar, there's a standalone website. You can still get to it from the NACOM website, but it's a, a NACOMCore.org. And within the NACOM or the core website, can't stand over there. This is what would come up. So you'll see on the introduction, the core. Then it, will, it randomly rotates uh, one of the competencies to highlight. So you'll see just from this screenshot, that's the competency of accountability and performance measurement. But that will change. And then at the bottom, it will tell you about NACOM. So you can also click on there to get to the NACOM website. And the NACOM website, there's a, a logo at the top that says core. You can click on that to get to the core website. So they're interchangeable, but you can go directly to the core website. The resources in 2015, there's a mini guide put out by NACOM on the new core. Uh, if you were a member then, you should have received it. You can still order the mini guide if you want a printed um, but you can also download it right from the core, and it's right there as a resource. And then each curricula is very extensive. Many of them are over 100 pages. You download the curricula, and um, it's set up to where you can teach from it. You can use it as your own um, enhancement. You can do presentations from it. And one of the things the core committee is doing is creating PowerPoints. So also on the core website, you can go to core news and core resources. And you'll see we've posted videos. We've posted the educational sessions from previous conferences on extending to the core to your court. And 
We've also posted PowerPoint presentations that you can take, use those PowerPoint presentations to teach yourself. So we've de developed quite a few of them, and that's an ongoing process. Every time an author of one in the curricula um, creates a PowerPoint to do at a presentation such as this, the core committee will post that on the website. So you can take that resource and use it yourself instead of creating your own. But within the curricula, I'm going to go through the different, the, the, within the principal modules, you've got purpose and responsibilities, public trust and confidence, and the authors of those. And then within the practice, that's the biggest component. And these are your day-to-day -day operations. And case flow and workflow, workforce manage management, operations management, ethics, public relations, budget and fiscal management, educational development, and accountability and court performance. Those are within the practice module. And then finally, within the vision module, we have the leadership, the court government, governance, and strategic planning modules, which Kent will be presenting today on the strategic planning. Every curricula is designed the same way. They'll all have the introduction, they'll have the learning objectives, the use of the curriculum, NACOM core references, and the target audience for that particular curricula. And then the educational content, there's faculty resources. Each one will have participant activities that you can take one or all of them, depending on how long you want um, the training to be notes for faculty and the bibliographies. So this would be your competency title at the top of your table of contents. So that will tell you what competency you're in. And at the bottom will tell you what module you're in. So those are all designed exactly the same way so you can have that resource. And here's the faculty resources within and the sample design of the different activities. So you could go directly to the activity page and pick out various activities that you want to use. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn, turn it over to Kent. But another thing I wanted to mention with regards to the core, as you find um, you're into it more, and there's, if there's one particular curricula that you're really interested in, the core committee um, has subcommittee groups that review the curricula, because we want to keep it up to date. We want to make sure all the hyperlinks within the curricula still work, that it references everything that you need as things change. So we have a review um, chairs, actually one of them's in the room, Janet Cornell. And we create subgroups for each curricula, and we're going through the review process of, of um, we're on our fourth one now. So if anybody's interested in being part of the chair or the core committee, just send me the chair an email at kathy at nakamnet.org. And if you're interested in one particular or any of them, we're taking volunteers to um, work on those curricula review. But even if you don't want to specifically work on one curriculum and you want to be part of the core committee, feel free. Our, our phone calls are the fourth Wednesday of each month at 3 o'clock. So if you want to sit in on a call, you can go to the NACOM website and the committee chair and you'll find the previous agendas, minutes, the number to call in. You can drop in on a call and just listen and feel free to participate. Thank you. And that's 3 Eastern. 3 Eastern time. Yes, 3 Eastern time. However, in February, it got moved to the first Wednesday of March. So anybody knew that wouldn't have been on that call because of a conflict instead of the fourth Wednesday, it is the first Wednesday of March for the February call. Uh, good morning. It's good to see so many of you today. I've um, been reminded that this is Mardi Gras, so I can't promise that anything in strategic planning will be that exciting, but hopefully it'll be a little more memorable, uh, worth taking away than uh, some cheap beads and a hangover. <laughs> 
Uh, let me start with a story. <laughs> In 1992, a new deputy clerk began working at the Hampton Juvenile and Domestic Relations District Court in Virginia. Hampton's a city of about 135,000 on the banks of the Chesapeake Bay across the harbor from Norfolk, Virginia. In many ways, the new clerk, and we'll call her Leslie, uh, Leslie found this court to be larger, busier, and more sophisticated than the court that she had come from. She had managed a court in Missouri, municipal court, Anyway, one way that this court was not particularly sophisticated was technology. And it's not that the court didn't have automation. There was a terminal system that connected to a mainframe in Richmond, but that system was strictly for case management. Didn't do any of the functions that one would associate with you know, word processing and what with per personal computers. And Leslie had gotten accustomed to that in Missouri and was kind of scratching her head when she got there. And it's not that they didn't have personal computers in this court. They actually had one for every clerk that was there. It's just that they were still in the boxes that they'd arrived in several months before, you know? Nobody seemed to know how to set one up, let alone what to do with one after that. Now, I do remember it's 1992. Not everybody had the experience with computers that we've got now. Still, you know, you'd think that somebody would have had a little bit of a no notion of what to do with these things. So anyway, Leslie asks some questions, and she gets some permission from the clerk, and pretty soon she's got her computer set up, and she's typing away on various templates for the type of documents that the judges are asking of their courtroom staff. And you can imagine, it didn't take long for the light bulbs to come on among all the other clerks, and soon they all had their court computers out and were learning all the benefits of a personal computer. Now. You can take several different lessons from this, as well as a cheap joke about hiring a gal from the show me state. But the one that I want you to think about today is that a good idea without some idea about how you're gonna implement it isn't worth anything. Now as changes go, that technology change in Hampton wasn't particularly difficult. But without some kind of plan, for how you're going to implement, you know, set up the computers and at least give some basic training to the clerks, nothing happened until somebody happened to come along who knew a little bit about the technology and by way of example could show everybody so they wouldn't be so afraid anymore. Well, a good court manager doesn't count on that kind of luck. So, how do we go about making sure that good ideas get implemented? Well, obviously we're here to talk about planning. But planning is not the answer for every type of change in courts. There are other means of doing that, and I would be leading you astray if I said otherwise. There's a good document uh, that Peter Kiefer wrote uh, for his phase three paper, in case anybody is interested, that looks at different me mechanisms for bringing about change. Uh, it's on the National Center's website, and you can look for his phase three paper that was completed in 2016. Now, some of you today who may just be interested in a little bit of, of learning about strategic planning, can I see a show of hands to who you might be? One, two, three, four, okay, good. Well, hopefully you'll come away with a few points about strategic planning, although obviously in less than an hour, I can only teach you so much, so it's gonna be kind of high level. But we want you to be aware that the core is very well aware of your interest and whether you are in this audience listening to the live stream or listening to this in a recording, the core committee encourages your interest in learning from the core curriculum materials. That being said, the core purpose of these curriculum, extending the core courses, is to learn about how to use the curriculum guides that we've developed to develop new presentations and courses about the various curricula, the competencies. So this is what strategic planning is going to be all about. Okay, for somebody going in online and looking at the core materials, the resources and the curriculum designs are on the right-hand side of the page. If it'll come up over here. Sooner or later. Anyway, it's over here. And as Kathy was mentioning, they're okay. 
All right, the curriculum, uh, it's not actually a curriculum. If there's, if there's any on the websites that are completed curricula, then I don't know of them. What they are, they are guidebooks to developing curricula. And there are also other resources that somebody can use. Some of the PowerPoints that Kathy was talking about can be used to put together your own educational materials. Okay, if somebody wanted to teach everything that's in this guide, it would probably take five days at the least. And a lot of that time would be spent in doing the various educational exercises that are provided for the instructors to use. I'll talk a little bit more about some of those activities in a little while. But one of the things that we want you to understand is that the content of these curriculum guides can be adapted to programs of many different varieties according to issues such as the time available, the sophistication of one's audience, as well as particular needs of an organization that you may be going into more as a consultant than as a teacher. Now, something I'm going to emphasize, re-emphasize, and hopefully you'll understand a little better why I'm saying this a little while. This is not a subject for beginners. If you're going to be teaching strategic planning, you really should have a grounding in a lot of the other competencies of the core. You should also uh, practical, have practical experience in actually doing strategic planning in courts. Now, Lacking strategic planning experience, I would at least suggest that you be a good teacher in some of the other core competencies. Because you can be an expert in a subject and not be able to teach it well. I can't tell you how many law professors I can say that about, but. <laughs> anyway, the same thing can be said for the audience for a strategic planning class. Now, the ideal audience should have at least a foundational understanding of what you know, why courts exist and what constitutes high performance in a court organization. We've got, you know, ultimately, strategic planning is a leadership tool. It's, it's something to be used to bring about intentional change in courts. So the audience that we really have in mind is, you know, people who are looking to extend their leadership capacities or they have in mind that they want to bring about intentional, purposeful, long-term change in their court organizations. Okay, before anybody goes to teach a course, they should learn a little bit about the audience that they're expecting to teach. So that will help in determining the content to use as well as how you're gonna deliver it, what you're gonna emphasize. So we recommend that you do some kind of needs assessment at some period in the process of developing your curricula. Now that can be in many different forms. It can be a written survey, it can be a focus group, it can be some kind of informal question and answer if you're just gonna be doing a short presentation. But what I want you to understand here is that um, it's, it's very flexible in terms of what the needs assessment can be. I did a course uh, for the Mid-Atlantic Association for Court Management at their conference last fall. And what I did is I adapted questions from the sample survey uh, that is in uh, the Appendix B of the Curriculum Guide. And I used SurveyMonkey to send that out to everybody several weeks in advance of the course and used the feedback that I got to determine what I was going to emphasize in my particular sessions. Now, you obviously, if you have many different contexts in which you are going to be teaching, different lengths of programs, your learning objectives can't be a one-size-fits-all. There are seven learning objectives that are actually you know, expressed in the curriculum design. Those would be appropriate to a course of at least two and a half days, like an ICM course. Obviously, if you have a shorter one, like the five-hour session that I had at the Mackham conference, you've got to simplify things a little bit. 
The seven topics that you see listed here are the ones around which I would recommend that any instructor develop their learning objectives for strategic planning. The actual guide has five sessions, uh, five sections that you see listed here. The first one, the preconditions for effective strategic planning begin with just an introduction to what the competency is all about. It throws in a little bit of additional information, introducing you to concepts that can determine whether a strategic planning effort will be successful or not. The second section are steps for actually doing a strategic planning process. And there are nine steps. Now that would be considered the fundamental content for most courses on strategic planning. It is not necessarily the most important capacity. If you're interested in the larger context of judicial administration and being able to leverage all of those competencies well on a day-to-day -day basis, and really some of the content in section three may be of greater importance and interest to you. And that's particularly the capacity for strategic thinking. Together, the three uh, last sections are the content that elaborates on some of what's introduced in section one on conditions that affect whether you should engage in strategic planning in the first place and whether any strategic planning effort will be successful in bringing about the change that you intend. All right, keeping in mind that there are going to be different ways in which you'll want to teach. The notes to faculty at the beginning of the guide provide three examples of different types of educational contexts. Conference session of one or two hours, a one-day session, similar to what I did uh, for Mackham, and a 2.5-day session as in an ICM course. Now, with respect to each of these three examples, There's some background here to guide the would-be instructor on the learning objectives and content that they might want to use in those three different contexts, as well as an indication of where they'll find the content that is being recommended. Okay, so the three examples that I just gave and that are in the guide aren't exhaustive by any means. A good instructor can develop their own learning objectives based upon the type of course that they intend, and that's one of, what one of the needs assessments are for, is to help to figure that out. Well, when I was teaching at Mackham, I knew that I was gonna have five hours over three sessions, and that the content that I was going to be teaching had to meet the requirements of the Michigan State University Accreditation Program. So I designed my course around the sections that you see listed here. The first session dealing with preconditions that are necessary to do effective strategic planning. The second session on dealing with the steps of the process. And the last one dealing with leadership and court culture. Okay, getting into some of the actual substance of the, of the guide begins, of course, with a definition of strategic planning, an explanation also that Strategic planning, you know, not all planning is strategic in nature. It's just one form of formalized planning. Uh, I guess I want to, whoa, let's back up. <laughs> um, I guess one of the things I should point out is this: the, uh, the italicized language that you see here is actually not in the first edition. It's one of the contemplated changes that uh, I'm thinking about for the next edition of the guide. And as Kathy remarked, we're all already trying to keep all of these fresh and up to date and all these little flags are indications of thoughts that I'm having about what I might change, improve, correct, or some, some little typos here and there. These, of course, are the nine steps of the process for doing an actual strategic plan. These were outlined originally by John Martin and Brendan, Brenda Wagon Connect Ivy in a series of SGI funded documents that came out in the late 1990s. The last of which is probably the one that's most often cited. It's called Strategic Plan Planning Mentoring Guidelines, Practical Tips for Court Leaders. 
Uh, it was completed in 2000 in collaboration with the Office of the State Courts Administrator in Florida, and that can be found online, although the quality of the PDF is questionable. Okay, the, the guide doesn't go overboard in terms of visuals, but the guide does recognize, oh, and I'm using the terms curriculum design and curriculum guide interchangeably. I'm sorry if that might have thrown some of y'all off a little bit. Um, Anyway, the curriculum design does use visual tools because it recognizes that people learn by different styles, so you need to teach to different styles, including those to people who are visually oriented. Uh, this particular figure is just an example of many that are adaptable to slides um, for anybody who wants to teach the subject. Uh, figure 2-1 and the one that's on the next slide are useful for pointing out to participants in a process that there's a difference between how the, the course is taught in a very linear step-by-step -step progression versus how it actually turns to play out in real life, where you may have different steps of the process that are occurring simultaneously and there may be feedback loops that are informing different steps of the process uh, throughout. Uh, this is another generic uh, image. This is one that I like to automate uh, to help people understand uh, some of the, the techie language that tends to be used a lot in step six and seven, where you're going from the description of the strategic priorities of the organization down to the selection of, of different strategies that would actually be in a plan, the actual action items. So I will then use actual examples, as you see listed here, that will appear on other slides so that they see the, the list and then they see it visually. Let me back up for just a second, because this may be a good point at which just to pause, see if anybody has any questions. This is the easy stuff. For those of you who are interested in the strategic planning, I've basically given you the managerial skeleton, the recipe, the, the instruction set. You know, the harder management stuff, the brain, the heart, the moves, you know, that's, that's harder stuff. Because you know, a recipe is only as good if the cooks know their way around the kitchen. And your principal ingredient in planning is people. People are not subject to easy programming. They can be taught and they can be led, which is something to keep in mind when the picture looks a little grim, as it may after the discussion of the next slide. Just as one must learn to walk before one can run, so an organization must learn to think strategically before it can plan strategically. And how can one think strategically about courts if you don't know what's strategic to courts in the first place? Okay, the philosophy that underlies this particular slide is the key to understanding what we put into this particular curriculum guide. It's not enough to know the steps of the process. As you might imagine, my co-author, Dr. Cyril Miller and I, have done a lot of strategic planning activities in our careers as leaders, as teachers, bless you, as participants in strategic planning processes. And, you know, if we went into most court organizations at the state or local level in this country, the truth is, bless you, <laughs> the truth is that very few of them would be capable of doing effective strategic planning. Now, why is that? because it's not enough for the key court leaders to know what strategic planning is all about, and many don't, let alone that they'd be able to pull together the necessary time and resources to do strategic planning. Most can't. Frankly, it's just very difficult to do strategic planning. You're, you're, in, a, in most courts, you're struggling to make to basic needs, to ba basic functions, the idea of doing strategic planning is daunting. And it's not a hopeless, but you know, the, you've got to understand what is required. Now, I'll come back to some points, assuming I can remember them. Again, in order to think strategically about courts, 
you gotta know what strategic two courts. And section 1-2, 1 1.2, is devoted to that particular topic. You first have to understand at the organizational level what the purposes and responsibilities of the courts are. And connected to that, you have to have an individual awareness, a line of sight to what each individual's job is with respect to those purposes and responsibilities. You add onto that concepts of service excellence, accountability for high performance, and then a mindfulness with respect to other aspects that are unique to that court that affect how it can operate. Its size, its jurisdiction, its culture, its partners in the local area. Boy, that really jumped. I'm not sure where I am. Okay. And some of the concepts that are strategic to courts are obviously covered in the competency materials of the other core competencies. So there's not a whole lot of need to go in depth in this particular curriculum design on those topics. So we go over at just the basic level to explain what their relevance is and then we make references to where they can find additional information if an instructor wants to draw from those particular curriculum areas. Now, for those of you who um, have the app or are listening um, to the live stream, there are built-in links already in this presentation. You could click on any of these boxes and it'll take you to those sites if you were interested in doing so. Strategic um, thinking, decision-making, and planning constitute the strategic process. And section three of the guide really tries to explore this in a way that helps people understand how they develop the capacity that leads to the ability to do strategic planning. Strategic thinking is involved in getting the organization to ask what might happen based upon a given set of circumstances that one is dealing with. And what, what options does the organization have? Strategic decision making takes those options and makes choices for the organization. And finally, strategic planning is only reached when you have the idea of what you want to do, and then it's a matter of how you're going to do that. I guess I should point out that this is, this is also why strategic thinking is so important, because it doesn't stop where strategic decision making begins. It continues throughout the process. It's also why I was saying earlier that it might be more important for people in judicial administration than strategic planning is because it connects to all the other competencies that we need to have as court managers. It helps us to leverage them, to make good decisions whether we ever do strategic planning or not. This illustration is sort of trying to get at the idea that I was just talking about, and I'm sorry if I'm you. There's no good place to stand, unfortunately, except way over here. Um, it illustrates the fact that strategic thinking is supposed to be, you know, mixed in with all the activities that we do uh, in, in, all the, in all the activities, both from the from formulation or the development of basic strategies to their ultimate implementation. In many ways, strategic thinking is the manifestation organizationally and individually of the use of all the other core competency areas. <coughs> okay. Whenever we're doing much work in the field of strategic planning, we need some kind of frame of reference with respect to the future. Now there are, and actually I should say futures, plural, because from any point in the present, there are multiple possible futures. There's a realm of all possible futures. There are plausible, probable, and preferred futures. Now part of the job of a change manager, which all of you should aspire to be, 
and that should also include all strategic planners, is to help the organization identify a preferred future and to then shift that future so that it's more and more probable. You see this big gap here. That's not necessarily the way that all futures would be, but you want to shift that preferred future into the probable range and make it an actuality. That's part of the, the element of the strategic planning process is to help make that happen. In the context of strategic planning, you need these types of references in order to have a sense of foresight and vision for what you want the court to be. Now this image shows how foresight plugs into that strategic process that I was showing you earlier. Foresight asks, you know, or, or it looks at what's happening, or what seems to be happening. It asks then what, what's really happening. And then that plugs into the question that we had earlier for strategic thinking. What might happen based upon what we understand to be happening now, what the current trends? What might we need to do? What will we do? And how will we do it? A, a way of looking at this is that foresight improves strategic thinking, leading to better discernment of the options that are available to the organization and ultimately to better decision making whether that be in strategic planning or any of the other competency areas. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we have a wide variety of participant activities or learning exercises that are built into the curriculum design. Uh, each one includes an explanation of the purposes, notes about the use of that particular activity, and which learning objective it's supposed to support. Now, the notes you know, may help guide the would-be instructor on different contexts for teaching. It, it may be that you'll want to skip certain exercises based upon the time involved, or if you may want to have some report outs that uh, are done a certain way. You know, that's what some of the practical aspects of the notes are. It'll also point out some of the interrelationship between various uh, activities so that you might want to combine them or do them in a specific sequence. That's particularly the case when I'm teaching in the section two, the steps for strategic planning. I want my exercises to build on one another, but I will often, for the sake of time, combine the exercises for mission, vision, and values. Okay, this is an example of one of the early activities in section one. And as I was saying, if it will come up. You see the content here. Information about the purpose of the activity. Notes about how it's used and which learning objective it supports. Now this particular activity is related to accountability and performance assessment. This is important in the context of preconditions for doing strategic planning. This helps an organization, a participant, look at it and see, is my court in a good state for doing performance measurement? If not, then it's probably not a good candidate for doing strategic planning. Because in order to do strategic planning well, you have several stages of the process at which you need objective data about the organization. At the beginning, to determine the need for and the process by which you might want to undergo strategic planning. In the middle of the process to determine the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that are facing the organization without which you can't identify the strategic priorities of the, of the process. And lastly, during implementation, when you're trying to figure out whether you're actually accomplishing what you mean to do and how do you make adjustments. One thing that um, I guess would be useful here, we have in Virginia uh, a program that we have developed. Um, it looks at the at developing in four phases the capacity of, of courts to become high performers. And this is one of the things that on that long slide that I had about strategic thinking that I was trying to remember. It, 
it may seem hopeless, you know, that your court doesn't have what it needs, but your capacities can be built over time. That's the thing, that good thing about the core competency curriculum. You can develop court's capacities for doing strategic planning just as you can develop court leadership. And in Virginia, as I said, we have this four-phase program for developing court, courts that are high performers, that are capable of doing strategic planning on a, on a regular basis. One of the first things we have to do in phase one is improve their data collection. As in many cases, they've got old cases on the books that might have been there for as many as 20 years. And until we can clean their books, we can't really tell how well they're performing. And without knowing how well you're performing, you can't answer the question, you know, what are, what's going on right now, let alone what will we do? So that's why this is an important precondition exercise. Now, this is another uh, assessment tool. This one was developed by Brenda Wagon Connect Ivy. Uh, I've used it in many different contexts. It helps the person who wants to do strategic planning think about how ready are we really to do this? Um, I've used it in the short uh, Macam conference. I used it at the end of the first session when I was talking about the preconditions for strategic planning, and it formed a, a good transition point before I talked about the steps of the process in the second phase. In the ICM course, this is actually done in the middle of the discussion of step one, when you're talking about, you know, should we do strategic planning, if so, how? Okay. Help. <laughs> there we go. Actually, that's gone forward. I'm pushing the back button. <coughs> well, what's supposed to be here is, is, is the is section at the end of section two of the guide that says that an instructor might want to use case studies. And case studies are good tools for intuitive learners in a longer course setting where people can learn better from examples and draw conclusions based upon that rather than telling them a step-by-step -step process and all the details that go into that. And the guide, in, in addition to that re reference in section two, in the faculty resources, there is not only a case study exercise outline, but there are links to materials from the educational programs at Boston University and at Carnegie Mellon that provide expert uh, direction in how one can use case studies as an instructor. Then in Appendix B, there are these two particular you know, actual strategic plans that could be used by an instructor in a case study. Now that's not the only way these could be used. An instructor can simply use these as reference tools in preparing him or herself to do the teaching. Uh, they could also be used in whole or in part among the participants in an ordinary class. I've often used the mission, vision, and values from the San Luis Obispo Superior Court strategic plan, uh, and that uh, has been very useful. Or they can use them in a whole for a case study type exercise. Okay, the last two sections, we've still got 15 minutes, right? Okay, I think that's, I think that's good. We have plenty of time for, for questions in a minute. Um, the last two sections are court culture and leadership. Now leadership is obviously a competency in and of itself. So beyond providing some definitions and some explanation for why it's important at various phases of a strategic planning process to you know, have some meaningful leadership, you know, we don't go overboard on that. I will elaborate in a slide or two on that. But court culture is far more important because it's not a competency in and of its own right, and yet it impacts any kind of change process that you might have in the court, whether it be a, a minor delay reduction effort or a comprehensive strategic planning process. Um, it's probably one of the subjects relevant to strategic planning that you find least discussed in the strategic planning literature. So that's one of the reasons that Cyril Miller and I thought it was important to devote an entire section of the guide to talking about 
what are the various types of cultures and courts? How do you assess what they are in your particular court? What are the implications of that for strategic planning? And lastly, you know, how do you adapt based upon the culture you have to have a, strate a successful strategic planning effort? Because, if any of you heard this statement before, culture eats strategy for <laughs> breakfast. What does that mean to y'all? Yeah. Well, in our organization, uh, in, unless we're very intentional about how we incorporate our strategic plan into our culture, the existing culture overruns anything. Very good. If if you don't, if, you know, you can have. Did anybody else want to say anything? But that's that's basically it. An organization can be facing a particular set of circumstances, an opportunity or a threat, and it may think it has the perfect culture to, I mean, a perfect strategy for dealing with that set of circumstances, but if the culture doesn't accept it, then it's toast. So, anyway, it's very important to understand culture as a court manager for any change effort. You have to understand for strategic planning, how it may impact your ability to do the process itself correctly, let alone to successfully implement any plan that comes out of the process. This book is about the closest thing we have to a Bible on culture in courts. Uh, it was written in 2007. Most of the authors are affiliated with the National Center for State Courts, or were affiliated. Roger Hansen's moved on. Um, but this book, which I think can still be bought, I don't think it actually appears online, is, is a very useful subject just for general understanding of change in courts. Section four, we try to explain at the front end what the culture types are and then get into what their implications is for the strategic planning process. Now, just as in a Myers-Briggs personality assessment, you're familiar with what those are, okay? They'll tell you that there's no good or bad, inherently good or bad personality type. It's the same thing with culture types. It doesn't mean that they can't have positive or negative implications for strategic planning or any other strain, uh, change management effort. Um, so when we try to go through this, um, there are five areas of court operations that are covered in the literature, and a court, a court never really has 100% of one culture type all of the time. And then the larger the organization, the more true that is, because you can have one department that has one culture and another department that has another. But the literature focuses on five aspects of court work. One is change management, another is court leadership, You've got internal uh, organization, judge staff relations, and case management style. Now, unless you're going to be engaged in some kind of delay reduction effort or something, then the case management style isn't particularly relevant to strategic planning. But all four of the others, the culture can have a significant bearing on your ability to do a process in the first place and to successfully implement any change at the, at the back end. And lastly, uh, the final section, we talk about leadership. Obviously, leadership is not something that is position dependent. Leadership can be exerted by anybody or any group at any level of an organization. And it's ultimately measured by the ability of that individual or group to influence the beliefs and behaviors of others. And in that context, the communication of vision is one of the, the most important uh, means by which that influence is exerted. So we provide some, some basic definitions, and then we talk about the importance of leadership in initiating a planning process, informing and communicating vision, uh, and providing honest assessment, uh, which as I said, is important in many different uh, phases of strategic planning, and lastly, in the implementation of any plan that you develop. And that's the point at which we can have some questions for those of you who are still awake. <laughs> yeah. Questions about strategic planning generally or about the, 
the use of the guide. Yep. You're good. I just had a question about assess um, attribution for when we're using the NACM slides. I've had a hard and pro parts of the program for other programs. I've had a hard time finding dates for the NACM materials. Dates for what we're putting into it, or the dates these things came out, or yeah, what, what's on the website if we're incorporating it into our presentations ah, and programs? A good point. And because they did come out at different times. They came out in a sequence. This was one of the last ones uh, that, was, that came out. And some of the first came out in 2015? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the mini guide was 2015, and that's when they started rolling up on the website. And we've got the revisions that have yes. already come out for two of them, I four, think. Four of them are, four have of been them. revived. OK. Are the dates anywhere on the website? No, they, they, they're not on the website. They're embedded in um, the back end that you wouldn't see, but they're not on the website. That's something we can think about. Um, yeah, that's a good point. We might have to... Copyright date or something. <laughs> right. And one thing I didn't mention at the beginning when I talked about the three different modules, um, the purpose module obviously would be for everyone within the court system. So you've got purpose and responsibilities, which a lot of people have used um, like as an onboarding process for new employees to put them through those two courses. The majority of the competencies fall within the principle, which I sh showed you that. And then strategic planning is within vision. There's only three there. And that would be more for your more experienced managers and um, with the vision to move on. And that's so um, that's why they're designed in three different modules based on the, who you're presenting to. So. Right. But um, so they're tools that you can use. And, and like I said, regardless of the position, those two in the purpose are really good ones to, for everybody within the whole system to, to be familiar with. Right. Any other questions with regards to either the material or the core itself? Gentleman at the back. I just had a question in reference to uh, the culture and the strategic planning. Do right. you have any uh, insight or is there any kind of lessons on how to, um, how to incorporate a good strategy into a bad culture? Huh. Well, cultural change is one of the most difficult things that, that, a, that any manager can have to deal with in any kind of organization, let alone an inherently conservative organization such as a court. Um, and it takes a long time. There is, among the materials that I'm thinking about um, adding to the second edition would be some information on cultural change. Um, it's not something that I encourage um, people to think about in a, sh strategic planning is long term in nature usually. I mean, we're talking two to five years. Cultural change can be even beyond that. It's like the, that four-phase program that we're trying to, to develop in high-performing courts. Part of that is changing the culture. And part of the reason it takes four years is because it takes time to convince the clerks, the case, you know, court managers, the judges, of just how important this is. Part of it's getting that data up at the front that says, you know, you're not doing so hot. Maybe you shouldn't be so wedded to what you know, your current behaviors are. Um, and then it's a, it's a learning process. As I said, people can be taught and they can be led, but it takes time and it's often very personality driven. You know, you, you can have one key individual who, you know, they got they to go before anything's going to get, you know, they have to be promoted, you know, they have to be mm, retired or disappear by other means. But. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reality of, of, of culture. And that's one of the reasons why I say it's better to approach strategic planning with an understanding of the culture you got. Because that's the one that you're going to have to get through the process with. And maybe over the course of implementation, you can change the culture. But during the process itself, you've got to understand what you got now and how do you adapt to that. Or do you not do it at all? 
If you're familiar with the cultures, an autonomous culture is an almost impossible one to do a strategic planning process because every person, particularly every judge, is going to do his or her own thing come hell or high water and they don't care what everybody else wants to do. Make sense? Familiar to people? Yeah? In, in that sort of a scenario, what are your thoughts on uh, trying to you know, find that person uh, and thanks. Um, finding that person and then trying to, I don't want to say in doctrine, but uh, bring them into the planning process so that you get their buy-in early on and then them as a social leader can really drug change. What are your thoughts on that? Well, some people you're never going to change, but some people you can, you can try different tactics. You can try using peer influence. If you're in a larger court, it may be that you can find two or three individuals who can more successfully approach that person than you can. Uh, it may be that you know that the person is going to rotate out of maybe a position of leadership and you can you know, take the long-term approaches. I know who the next you know, leader is going to be, the chief, and I'm going to work with that person on the long-term game. So that's, that would be one suggestion. Did that cover what you want? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, well that concludes the session. I want to thank you for attending. And again, if you haven't already looked at all the core material, make sure you, it's a tremendous amount of resource there on the web for you to either use for yourself or any staff. So, thank you.